everybody, it's Mrs. Mancuso, and today's topic is ionic bonding. So when you form an ionic bond, it's between a metal and a nonmetal. So if I grab my reference table, that means that on the periodic table, I'm gonna bind something here on the left side with something here on the right side. So, salt. NaCl, that is the result of an ionic bond. Na would love to lose one electron. Cl would like to gain one electron. So together they make a perfect pair. You crisscross their charges and you end up with NaCl. Because there's positive and negative, the attraction between one NaCl and another NaCl is gonna be very strong. So let me draw this like this. Let's say an Na is an open circle and a Cl is a dark circle. NaCl would look like this. This is the compound, it has this fixed ratio. This side is positive, this side is negative. They are transferring electrons. So ionic bonds are always transferring an electron from the metal to the nonmetal. So Na is losing one and Cl is gaining one. There is a high attraction between molecules. Another NaCl can arrange itself like this. So this side is negative and this side is positive and there are very, very strong attractions between these molecules. It's all about the charges. If you put something that is ionic in water, it's soluble. That's why we get NaClAq. It mixes well with water. When you put it in water, it dissociates into its ions, Na plus and Cl minus. So each of these ions would be in the liquid. If I had a water molecule, the O side of the water is negative, so it would be attracted to the Na. And the H side of the molecule is positive, and that would be attracted to the Cl. So this, um, these charges in here make this a great electrolyte, which means it's able to conduct electricity because there are mobile charged particles. Okay, let's talk about how you do a Lewis dot diagram for an ionic bond. So, Lewis dot diagrams. If you are doing an ionic Lewis dot diagram, I like to say it's as easy as ABCD, put the atoms, brackets, charges, and dots. So let's do something different so we're not just doing the same thing. Let's say I have nickel two chloride. Nickel two tells me that I write Ni. Two tells me the charge on nickel, so I put a plus two. Chloride is chlorine, chlorine is a negative one. I crisscross, I get Ni, Cl, two. That is the formula. Now to do the Lewis dot diagrams, I need the atoms, so I need one Ni, I put it right in the middle. I need two Cl's, I put one here, I put one here. B brackets, I put brackets around all of the atoms. C, charges, the charge on Ni was a plus two, the charge on both of the Cl's is a minus one. If you have a compound and not an ion, you should be able to add up the charges and always equal zero. It will let you know, like for example, if I had left off one of my chlorines, this is not right, because it's not adding up to zero. They should add up to zero. It reminds you to make sure that you've accounted for all of your atoms. The last step is dots. Positive lost its dots. Negative gained a dot. Chlorine used to have seven, now it has eight. So I put my eight dots on. There we go. That would be the correct Lewis dot diagram for an ionic compound. If I am given a formula, so let's say Fe2O3, and I need to come up with the name, what I can do is reverse my charges to figure out what this metal's middle name is. So anytime I have a transition element, so those are the elements here in the middle of the periodic table, they have multiple oxidation states. Look at Mn, it's got four different possible charges. Iron's got two, cobalt's got two, 
um, they, there's multiple. So in order to know which number they are, I do this. This came from here, a negative two. This came from here, a positive three. My metal's always gonna be my positive. My non-metal's always gonna be my negative. Then when I write the name, I write iron three. I put the three as Roman numerals inside of a parentheses, and then ox -eyed. That's how I do it. And if I was using something from table E, so let's say I had MN3, PO4, 4. First of all, I want to crisscross back up. So this is a 4, and PO4 is a 3. And then the name, manganese 4. And then PO4, I go here to table E. So I grab my reference tables, I find table E, and I find PO4. So there's PO4, its name is phosphate. Well, I don't change the name, I keep it exactly as it is, phosphate. And I saw that PO4 really did have a minus three, so that's perfect. All right, so this would be the name of my ionic compound. So, properties of ionic compounds. They tend to have very strong attractions. Again, that goes back to what we drew at the beginning with the positives and negatives. So here's positives and negatives. Another NiCl would be very attracted to it um, because of the charges. So strong attractions. Strong attractions lead to high boiling points and melting points. So to boil something, you wanna take the molecules and you wanna have them separate from each other. So you have to break intermolecular forces of attraction. That's gonna take a lot of energy because there's strong attractions. So anytime you have strong attractions, it's going to have a high boiling point and a high melting point. These tend to be crystals. Most salts are crystals, which means that another property is they tend to be hard solids. All right, so thanks for joining me for review and join me again next time.